you know, our, our continuing students of the vast majority of, of our, our students here at William and Mary were able to register for their fall classes back in March. Um, and so because we most of our students have already been able to get into the system and to register for courses, um, obviously the, they, those students are taking up seats just like every other student. Um, so if, if you see fewer seats or you see closed, uh, closed courses in particular, um, um, that's because the way our registration system works is we prioritize um, students based off of their, their social class. So our folks getting ready to graduate, junior, seniors, um, and then our incoming students or incoming freshmen transfers can register in the summer. Wonderful, thank you. What about the closed call 100 and 150 freshman classes? Good question. So we do have some uh, some courses that have been filling up. So we did have a priority registration window this past week for students in certain scholarship programs. Um, other courses, if uh, if they're not at that 15 uh, enrollment limit yet, they will be opened by Monday. So we do try to manage seats as much as possible as the vast majority of our freshmen will be getting into register on Monday. Thank you, Shelley. Taylor, do you find that helpful? Wonderful. What other questions? Okay, I have one from Kim. I have an incoming freshman. Am I correct in understanding that he is to just register for two courses on Monday and the rest during orientation? That is correct. So uh, William and Mary really pride ourselves on having a faculty advisor model. And so during the summer, we limit our incoming students to register for just uh, two courses and then when they get here at orientation, they're able to meet with their advisors during orientation. And after that meeting, they can register for up to 16 credit hours. Thank you. With the shift to increase remote learning, will the number of seats be increased in some classes? Great question. <laughs> um, so, uh, so one thing that um, I wanna make sure folks understand about the different uh, modalities for, instructor, for instruction this fall, we asked our faculty how they wanted to teach their courses. Uh, a lot of our faculty preferred doing face-to-face -face options. However, when we had to adjust our classroom capacity based off of distancing guidelines, we found that that greatly reduced our uh, classroom capacity on campus. So as you can imagine, we're going into classrooms and we have to measure out the proper distancing guidelines. We can't have as many students in the classroom as, as we normally do. Um, and so, what you're seeing now in the attributes that are loaded into Banner is courses that are going to be offered face-to-face, -face, courses that are going to be offered in a mixed modality, meaning the, the instructor has some flexibility in how they do that, but the student does need to be here in Williamsburg, and then our remote options. So we have remote asynchronous, meaning the courses are remote and students don't have to necessarily meet at specific times uh, for lectures and things like that, and remote synchronous, meaning students do need to gather at specific times. So there, there is some variety there. Um, as I mentioned, because of the decrease in classroom capacity, uh, we actually are seeing more remote courses uh, just to accommodate uh, all the classes we normally would be teaching. We also have some faculty that want to be extremely flexible. So the registrar's office is working right now with faculty who, you know, maybe they're doing a mix or face-to-face -face option, but then they also want to offer one section of the same class uh, for students that are remote. So we might even see a few more remote sections rolling out of courses as faculty are trying to be as flexible as possible to the different needs of our students. I think that answered the question, Heather. If not, let me know. <laughs> yeah, if you feel like um, to the family who submitted that, if you need more information, feel free to submit a follow-up question. Um, is there a person who, could who a student could schedule a specific time with for individual academic schedule guidance? Yes, so if you go, uh, if you go to the William and Mary website um, and you search for the Office of Academic Advising, you can schedule an appointment online through our website. Uh, and obviously we're meeting with folks via Zoom and phone. So, so yes, uh, students can, are more than welcome to schedule appointments to meet with us. Wonderful. I have another question. Is there going to be a more specific schedule registration time frame assigned to students because my students still list the entire 10 day period? Um, so we are intentional in, in offering students a really wide window to make changes uh, or to register for classes, especially in the summer, because in normal pre-COVID times, we had lots of families that were traveling or 
or students that were away and weren't necessarily able to log onto their computer. So if, if your student logs into Banner, they can see their exact time ticket and their windows for registration. But yes, we do give larger windows because we do have folks that can't necessarily log on as soon as the window opens. So we wanna make sure there's plenty of time available for students to log on. Wonderful. And for families who have just joined or I just admitted from the waiting room, um, we're submitting our questions via chat since there are quite a few of us on the meeting today. Um, if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to continue submitting those and I will be asking those from the chat. Shelly Lorenzo, who is with us, is from the Office of Academic Advising. So we're going to get through some of these registration questions first, but I'm, I'm here to answer any other questions as well. So I have a question about um, if I'm not able to register for a class during the eight credit period and it fills up, is there a wait list that students can put their name on ahead of the add drop period? Sure. So what we do here at William & Mary is uh, our instructors have a lot of control uh, and, and, and flexibility in terms of how their classes fill up post, um, post cap enrollment. So students can email faculty and request an override. Um, that's, that's kind of the next best option. We don't have a waitlist feature in our system per se, but it, students can reach out to the instructors to request an override. Thank you. So can you explain the process for students who want to change their classes to a remote option? And are we increasing the number of online classes this semester? Sure, so for students who are considering rem a remote option, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, Number one, taking to, into account how the student feels and how the student um, feels comfortable in terms of uh, taking classes remotely, especially for remote asynchronous courses. That's really a lot of onus on the student to be responsible, to keep up with the readings, to keep up with the assignments, and to stay on top of everything, right? It's one thing if I know if Heather's my instructor and class is at three, I'm going to get the readings done by three before I see my instructor. Whereas with asynchronous courses, you know, there might be deadlines and, and different things like that, but it doesn't have that same kind of time crunch or that time pressure that a synchronous course has, even remote synchronous. So that's something to think about in terms of comfort level. Uh, how does the student feel? Again, high level of responsibility uh, with taking courses remotely. Once the uh, folks have decided that that's a good fit for them, that, that they do feel comfortable taking courses remotely, then there's kind of the, the trickle down effect, right? So if, if you're not gonna be on campus, do you have a housing contract? So if you have the housing contract, you need to reach out to the Office of Residence Life to cancel your housing contract. Um, students have time to cancel their, their housing contract, um, but do know that when students are requesting to cancel their housing contract, it'll come up as pending. It won't be finalized until Residence Life can see that a student is in all remote courses. So just know that, especially if you need to make changes to your, your schedule. So for continuing students, they can't log in to make changes until the first week of August. For our incoming uh, freshmen and transfer students, they can't finalize their schedule until August 17th. But Residence Life knows all of that, um, but just know that they, they will consider it pending until then. Um, same thing with meal plans, right? If you're not gonna be on campus, you wanna make sure you cancel your meal plan. So there's kind of the trickle down effect. So again, that first question that I really want folks to consider is how comfortable do they feel taking classes remotely? Um, do they have stable internet? Uh, do they have devices that are, that are gonna work? Um, do they feel like they can kind of hold that high level of responsibility to be successful in a remote environment? And then kind of from there, then making uh, those cancellations for uh, housing, meal plans, that sort of thing. Thank you. I have a question here about the path forward in general. So in the path forward, it is mentioned that students should self isolate for eight days prior to campus. Um, are there details on what eight day self isolation entails and what would make the eight days start over. So for that eight day self isolation period, basically, we're asking students to do their best um, to follow best practices. Maybe don't go shopping for all of your dorm supplies during that eight day period before you come to William and Mary try and pre-plan those things now. So any trips out into a public space with other folks that you wanna pre-plan those so that that eight day period, that student can try their best to remain home, wearing a mask, washing their hands and following all of the best practices that the CDC has set forward for us. What would make the eight days start over? Nothing really. So we understand that students are not gonna be in a bubble from the time they leave their hometowns to the time that they arrive at William & Mary. 
but again, following the CDC best practices during that travel time frame. So it won't start over. We're not expecting that folks get a hotel for the 10 days prior to moving in. It's just that we're expecting families and students to do their best as they're, as they're traveling to William & Mary. And again, any follow-up questions, let me know. Um, I'm letting a couple folks in from the waiting room, so I'll explain what we're doing here again. Um, this is just a casual Q&A time for us. So if you've already asked your question and you have no more, you don't have to stick around until five. You can pop out, you can leave whenever you want. Um, this is just an opportunity for families to ask questions. I have Shelly Lorenzo here from Academic Advising to answer any advising or registration related questions. I'm here as the Assistant Director of Parent and Family Programs to answer any other questions, for example, that one about travel. Um, and so just submit your questions through the chat. I'll be moderating um, until about five o'clock, um, letting folks in as they hop on. And again, please do not feel like you have to stay here the whole time. I'm also recording this. So this will be available on our YouTube channel after this session is over. So if you're like, people are asking really good questions and I'm not taking notes, um, how am I gonna remember all this? I will post it on our YouTube channel and you will receive the recording in next week's newsletter. So I have a question, will there be sanitizing wipes or spray at each classroom door for desk cleaning, et cetera, since students are required to clean before and after class? Shelly, that might be something you could help me with more on the academic spaces side of the house. Um, I do know that there are gonna be sanitizing stations located everywhere across campus. Um, cleaning will be happening more regularly. There will be temperature check stations across campus. Um, but Shelly, do you have any information on like the academic spaces in particular? Sure, uh, great question. So um, just like Heather said, um, our facilities folks have been working really diligently around campus to, to keep things clean, to keep things sanitized, uh, and try to make uh, sure that we're following all proper guidelines. As far as the academic buildings go, I haven't heard a ton specific guideline for the academic buildings. I will say I've heard a little bit from the folks in swim library, um, and almost similar to how when you go to the gym, right, and you have to wipe your equipment down after you use it, it sounds like swim library is looking at similar sort of protocols so for shared resources that students would have the opportunity to wipe down their equipment, um, computers, things like that before and after they use it. Uh, so again, I haven't heard specifics about classrooms yet, um, but uh, I know our facilities folks are working really hard to, to make everything safe for people. And as we approach the beginning of the semester, more information will be coming out at um, a more frequent pace in terms of the specifics about how we're maintaining cleanliness in spaces. So just be on the lookout on the path forward and any email updates um, as more information will be coming out. Someone mentioned they had a hard time hearing me, so I put on my um, fun announcer headset that I borrowed from William & Mary Athletics. Hopefully you can hear me just a little bit better. Um, if not, please continue to let me know. So should our students have heard from their peer advisor by now, or are students expected to reach out to the peer advisor if they have questions? Sure, so all students should have heard from their peer advisors by now. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind is uh, peer advisors are only emailing students at their William & Mary email address. So the first thing we wanna make sure is that uh, our students are checking their William & Mary email address. After that, be sure to check in the spam folders so peer advisors act as the teaching assistants for college studies, which is our online short course in Blackboard. So they're sending out their emails through the Blackboard system, and sometimes Blackboard will misidentify those emails as spam and send them to those folders. So check there. If for some reason a student hasn't heard anything yet, or in particular, if a student was uh, admitted later to the institution and we might not have gone through all of those initial steps to get them set up, please email advising at wm.edu and we'll investigate and get them uh, straightened out. Wonderful. And the next question here was who do we need to contact if my student's peer advisor does not reply? Would that be academic advising? Yes, yes. So again, please email us at advising at wm.edu and we'll, we'll make sure you get taken care of. Wonderful. Thank you. 
So I have a question. What can the family expect to happen after their student has moved into their residence hall? Um, so more information came out about what the check-in for residence halls would look like this week. Um, residence Life sent an email, and you can read that email in full on Residence Life's homepage. So for families, you're going to have about an hour for your student to check into their residence hall and an hour to help them unload, unpack, and set things up in their space. After that, that's kind of when the see you later happens. Um, we know that there will be a few days that moving in happens and our primary orientation activities will really kick off that last day of move in. However, there will be optional welcome, ev welcome events for students to take part in during all three days of move in. Um, so that might be different for every family and that's something you might want to have a conversation about is do you want to take them to lunch after do you want to take them to dinner after um, but recognizing that you'll only have a couple hours on campus to help them really settle into their residence hall space and then it's up to the family to determine how that see you later happens um, and that of course depends on when your time your time slot is for move in a question here, Shelley, you might be able to help me with. Are choir classes still being offered during the pandemic? That is a really good question. I'll be honest, I haven't had a chance to dive into all the different courses, um, and especially the different modalities that they'll be offered in this fall. So I, I will check it now when we're all here together. Let's Wonderful. What well, doing. Yeah, while she's checking, I had another question about move-in. Um, do parents leave students there and can parents come back to visit and bring stuff after? I think for this move-in time period, um, want to be a little bit strategic in that if there is any shopping or things that need to happen, that, that happens before you move your student in rather than after you move your student in. Um, just because your student might be busy with orientation activities and they might be busy making friends with either their roommates or the folks on their hall and so those trips probably should happen before you drop your student off um, at William and Mary for move in. Hopefully that answers your question. Might not be the answer you wanted to hear but hopefully that answers the question. Uh, so Heather I checked um, on our, our open course list website and it looks like we are still offering, uh, we do offer both voice lessons right as well as instrumental lessons and it looks like those are still intended to go forward. Uh, there could be some accommodations obviously made uh, uh, to ensure folk safety in those environments. Um, if a student has any specific questions about how things like that might work out, um, I always encourage students, if you're already enrolled in the class, please email the instructor and check because again, they're, we're all working on this. We want to make this safe for everyone. So my hunch is they're, they're probably getting really creative with how we can still do that for students. Wonderful. Shelly, is there a specific time frame for changing classes during August or at the beginning of the semester? And what are those dates? Sure. So um, part of this depends on the status of the student. So for our incoming students, for our incoming freshmen, they have registration windows in July where they can register for up to eight credits. And then that Monday of orientation, August 17th, so exactly a month from today, uh, they can enroll in up to 16 credit hours. For our continuing students, um, so our sophomores, juniors, seniors, they can get back into the system starting the first week of August and make changes to their schedule then. Um, so we know folks are, uh, might be anxious to make changes based off of the attributes, um, the instructional delivery attributes and need to make changes. So students can go in and make changes starting the first week of August and they can check their specific time and date information in Banner. Wonderful. So I have a question here. We are trying to decide if it makes sense to come to campus if all or most courses will be online. Our son learns best in seminar and discussion courses, which is why he chose William and Mary. However, we won't really know until orientation after move in how many, if any, will be face to face. Do you have some guidance on how many freshman offerings will be hybrid or face to face? It feels like what we are seeing on course listings is mostly online. Yes, um, so, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, majority of our faculty did want to teach face-to-face -face or have some sort of mixed options, but when we assess our classrooms uh, for new capacity levels based off of distancing guidelines, we found that we just had a reduced classroom capacity when taking into con uh, consideration the distancing we need to put in place. Um, the one thing to note is there could potentially still be some shifts with course attributes as things change or 
uh, um, as we're trying to be adaptive and responsive to the needs of students. Um, you know, one of the things I would encourage students to do is you can obviously check and see kind of what, um, what the options are for different classes. So especially thinking about a lot of our um, kind of traditional freshman classes, you know, I'm doing a quick search over to see, you know, like a call 150, for example, um, we do have a number of sections that are going to be offered face to face. Those tend to be smaller classes, so it's it can be easier to find capacity for them compared to larger classes. So all that to say, it, it takes some time to search these things out, um, and we really want to be accommodating for students and figure things out. And again, if, if you have additional questions or concerns, don't hesitate to reach out to our office. You can schedule an appointment online with one of our advisors, and we can um, we can help walk you through some different things there. I see a question here. Can we just hang out in the room with you until 5 p.m.? Sure, feel free. Oh, There's going to be a lot of great info here. And um, you know, Heather, I don't know if you can hear it or not, but my senior citizen Beagle is in here and snoring very loudly. So clearly he's made himself at home. He's not moving until 5 o'clock. So. I love that. My, my golden retriever is napping next to me too. Luckily, he doesn't snore. Um, but you all can stay with us until 5 p.m. if you're enjoying the information. Now, if you did ask your question, your question has been been answered and you're wondering, can I, can I go now? You can leave whenever you want to. Not going to hold anybody um, for ransom here in this Q&A space. I see a question about move out. I saw the date said move out November 25th. Will students be required to completely move out after exams? I would encourage you to reach out to Residence Life for full details, uh, but I don't believe that students will be required to fully and completely move out um, for winter break. I'm reading a website right now, which is why I'm looking down at my phone. So typically during a winter break, if you're returning to the same room assignment in the spring, you do not have to remove your belongings or turn in your key. Um, but if you do have questions specifically about that, please contact Residence Life. Um, they would be great folks to answer that question. I see a question about, I have been hearing that after move-in, students cannot leave campus. I was wondering if you can elaborate on that a little bit more. So I actually verified this information with Residence Life yesterday. Um, so once you move in your student, we are not going to tell them, and there's no policy in place that says they cannot leave campus. Um, again, you have to make the decisions that's best for your family and your students. So if you want to take them out for lunch in Colonial Williamsburg or take them out to that last dinner before you say see you later, that is up to you and your family. Now, if your student moves in and right after they move in, our mandatory orientation activities begin, then they probably shouldn't leave campus because they have to stick around for orientation activities. But if you're moving in that first day of um, move in and you still want to take your student out for one last meal together as a family, that is up to you and your family. There is no policy in place. We just ask that students are as safe as possible when they leave campus um, in order to protect our community and that they're following CDC guidelines. For asynchronous courses, Shelley, how will students connect with professors? Great question. So I think uh, faculty are setting up different ways for students to be able to connect with them. So one of the expectations is faculty still have to have office hours, even if they're not meeting with students uh, at a specific time to teach the course. So faculty will still have office hours that they'll be available to work with students. Um, obviously, like everyone else, folks have different comfort levels with technology. So there might be some Zoom options. There might just be phone options. Uh, that sort of thing. So I think instructors are, are, you know, building options around what they're most comfortable with and what works for their students. But yes, there will still be office hours for folks to connect with their faculty. I have a general question about the registration process. Can you briefly describe the registration process for incoming students, um, including key dates and deadlines they should be aware of? Yes, um, happy to help. It's a lot of moving pieces. Um, so for our incoming students, for our incoming freshmen in particular, their registration window starts in July. And so uh, students can check their banner, their my.wm.edu, just for the specific time that their registration window starts. Part of that registration process is students have to complete college studies. College studies is our online short course that helps introduce students to academic life at the institution. Part one is all focused on the liberal arts education and academic advising. So students have to complete part one of college studies before they can register for their classes this month. Um, so that's something that's, that folks need to be aware of. 
once they've done that, once they have their registration window, they can register for up to eight credit hours. Fast forward to orientation. Uh, during that orientation Sunday slash Monday, students will have the opportunity to meet with their pre-major advisor. Um, again, for, for our remote students, that will take place remotely. For our students on campus, it might be some sort of hybrid of meeting outside or something like that, whatever's comfortable for all parties involved. Talk to them, go over what they have registered for, what else they wanna register for. And then the Monday night of orientation, August 17th, students can then register for the remaining credits they need to be at a full-time status. They can go up to six, 16 credit hours. Starting the next day, that Tuesday begins our add drop window. And that's for all students. That's for continuing students and incoming students. And that add drop window will go all the way until the second Thursday um, of the semester, which let me check it so I get the date right, August 27th. So then the add drop window is from August 18th to August 27th, again, for students to make changes to, to their schedule. I think that's all the big dates. <laughs> okay. We've got lots of questions, which is great. So if you're just joining us, feel free to submit a question in the chat. I have Shelly Lorenzo here from Academic Advising. I am the Assistant Director of Parent and Family Programs and will answer any outside of academic advising registration course related questions. So I'm going to read through some of the questions here. Are all classes, even those listed as face-to-face, -face, available in online format as well in the case that students get coronavirus and have to quarantine? So no, not like automatically delivered also online, but all of our faculty are creating their courses with flexibility in mind, understanding that this may be something that they experience in their class. So being able to deliver that content online if it needs to, being flexible with deadlines and making sure that students are able to take care of themselves, but also pursue their academics as they are able. Shelley, does that about cover it? Yes, yeah, so the, the attributes that are currently assigned to the class, again, there might be some modifications um, as we firm up the semester schedule, but the intention is if it's a face-to-face -face class that it will continue face-to-face. -face. Um, and like Heather said, uh, our faculty are fantastic. They, they wanna support our students, they wanna help them, they wanna help them succeed. So as things come up um, uh, between the faculty and you know, students office and our office, we all try to work together to support the student um, to help them to be successful. I think the other thing that it's um, important for families and students to know as well is, you know, our, our, our faculty are, are just as in this and just as committed to safety and to uh, wellness as, as, our, as, as you all are. And so again, they wanna do what's in the best interest of their students um, and, and what's in the best interest of our larger campus community too. Thank you. My student received an email from a professor indicating that the modality had changed from synchronous to asynchronous. Will professors be able to continue changing the format of classes in the coming weeks? And is there a stop date of when changes to course modalities can be made? That's a really good question. So I think um, one of the things that I wanna share is I think uh, some of the reasons you might continue to see changes to, to the modalities is faculty trying to be responsive to the needs of their students. Um, so I know I've heard of some instructors who, once they've understood that many of the students in their class wouldn't be able to come back, or um, you know, another example is our international students that might not be able to come back to the United States, they're now adjusting those courses to work for those students. Um, or some faculty are even setting up different sections of their course, so they might have one section of their course that has some face-to-face -face components, and then they're going to set up another section that is remote for students that can't be there, so that way they're um they're again trying to be flexible to the needs of the students and things like that um i don't know for certain at this point if there will be kind of a, a final cutoff date when um when faculty can't make changes i will say you know we're still kind of in mid-july so i would anticipate until the end of july there might still be some tweaking um after after that point i think any tweaks that were that would happen would be the result of, of something changing and either for the faculty or for the bulk of their students, right? So again, right now tweaks are happening to be responsive to the needs of students. Um, I, they're still working through some of those pieces, um, but as we all know, kind of working and operating and living under this pandemic, uh, it, it's really hard to give dates and deadlines of when things will, will stop shifting for us. But I think the intention is to try to wrap up as many tweaks as possible by the end of this month. Thank you. 
Question about laptops or computers. Would you please advise the optimal computer requirements for new students and what would you recommend from the bookstore? Um, I think selecting a laptop or a computer is a very personal choice. Um, and so I think it depends on what your student typically does on a device. Um, keeping in mind, do they have any classes that they know of right now that are offered online? Um, is that something that they will be experiencing? Do they binge Netflix all the time? Are they a gamer? Is that something that is very important important to them and so I think those are considerations you need to make. I'm posting in the chat right now a link to the Tribe Guide checklist which has a full page on laptop orders and how to connect with the bookstore. Um, I would recommend contacting the bookstore and asking some of those more specific questions. They'll be able to better assist you in selecting something that fits the needs of your student. If my student moves in on Friday, will she miss activities offered Wednesday through Friday? Not necessarily. We're offering these activities so that students don't feel like they're just sitting in their residence hall all by themselves with nothing to do. So uh, more information will come out about these activities, but all of the mandatory orientation activities that are going to be really community building and resource sharing are going to happen after that last day of move in so that everyone has that shared experience. But we don't want students who move in on that first day to feel like there's nothing to do and they don't know anybody on campus so it's just an opportunity to provide some engagement for those families so if your student has already selected for example the last day of move-in um, no need to change it unless your student just feels really strongly that she wants to be there for some of those more optional activities I have a question here about how will meal plans work for students moving in on August 12th and 13th? When does the meal plan begin? That's a wonderful question. Shelly, I know you've experienced a lot of meal, meal plan questions. Um, do you happen to know the answer to that question? You know, I should by this point. I'm going to pull up their website because I'm 99% sure I read it somewhere and then I'll report back. <laughs> ah, it begins August 8th. I just had to scroll down. Perfect. <laughs> um, so the meal plan begins August 8th and I'm also going to post a link to the meal plan website here in the chat because um, lots of information there about specific meal plans. I have many tabs open in anticipation of questions. I just needed to scroll down to the bottom of that one. And for folks who may have just joined us, I mentioned this earlier, but you can stick around till five if you want, but this is also recorded and will be shared later. So if you've asked your question and, and you don't really want to stick around the whole time, you don't have to. Up to you. If there was a specific class my student wanted to take that wasn't offered at William & Mary, would it be possible to take that class online at a different institution but still get credit for it at William & Mary? Great question. Um, so kind of the default setting for any credits a student earns post-matriculation is for those credits to come in as elective credits. If a student wants it to count for something in particular, there's a process through which a student can excuse me, petition for course substitution. We have a committee on degrees, which is chaired by the Dean of Undergraduate Students and um, uh, it contains faculty members as members of the committee and then they review all of those course substitution requests. So yes <laughs> is, is the short answer. Students can do that. Um, again, there's a little bit of a process involved. Um, if they wanted to count for something particular, they need to submit a petition to the committee on degrees. In general, they also have to get permission from the uh, registrar's office. Um, Mainly that's kind of a security mechanism for the student so that they know even before they take the class what it's going to transfer in as. As I said, it's going to be an elective credit, uh, but just so students can see, okay, this is going to count as English 2XX or, or whatever it will be. So all students have to get permission from the registrar's office if you wanted to count for something specific. Um, there's a petition for that. If you're looking to do, so in general, students take courses elsewhere over the summer. Um, that's kind of the most logical time for students to do that. Um, if it's taking place during the academic year, um, it's, what's a good way to say that? It's against William & Mary policy for students to be enrolled in classes elsewhere during the fall and spring semester. Um, if it's something that's necessary or something a student needs for some reason, please reach out to our office. Let's set up a time to talk. Um, uh, it's, it's complicated, but, um, but there are options for students that are interested in doing that.
Thank you. I have a couple questions about underloads. I'm an incoming freshman and I'm planning to study remotely. I'm meeting with enrollment services soon as I plan to petition for an underload. Is there anything else I need to do in terms of meeting with academic advising or connecting with an advisor? And how do I find out who my advisor is? Sure. Um, so, so lots of great pieces there. Um, yes, I know in anecdotally, I've had more conversations with students, both incoming and continuing students um, who are considering taking an underload for the fall semester, uh, especially if they're considering being remote. Um, so the Committee on Academic Status uh, reviews requests from students to be in an underload, um, similar to our other kind of committees around academic issues. It's, it's made up of faculty members that kind of review those requests and, and make those determinations. It definitely doesn't hurt to meet with someone from our office. Really what we would wanna to try to do is see what would be potentially long-term effects of taking an underload in, one, in, in one particular semester. So what might your spring then look like? What would summer maybe look like? Would summer be an option for you? That sort of thing. So um, you don't have to meet with us, but we definitely, if that's helpful, if you wanna brainstorm, we're, we're more than happy to do that. Did that answer the whole question, Heather? I believe so. There was okay. another question about underloads that I wanted to tackle at the same time. Okay. If a student requests an underload to take one class this semester, will this help with registering for classes next semester? No. Um, I, I guess the reason I say that is our, our registration windows, uh, again, are based off of um, social class for the student. And so a student wouldn't be progressing in their academic plan if they're just taking one course. Um, so again, these are very personal decisions and, and, and students and families need to think about what makes the most sense for them and for the student. Um, so a student obviously is more than welcome to submit a petition for something along those lines, uh, get feedback from the committee and go forward from there. Um, but it, it wouldn't have any sort of, it wouldn't really have a major impact on when they register them for the next semester. Thank you. Do you have a sense of how language classes are being handled this semester? Yeah, this is, this is actually um, a, a big change for us as an institution. So historically, you know, William and Mary has uh, really valued kind of face-to-face -face connections for language development and, and language proficiency and, and mastery. And obviously we're trying to adapt to create environments that are safe for our faculty and safe for our students to continue with learning. So I, I know a number of our language courses will be offered remotely this fall, I think our faculty are getting really creative um, with how to do that and what that will look like. I will say the one thing to know about taking remote classes in the fall semester is our instructors actually have time to prepare for what that's going to look like. In the spring semester, our faculty had one week to turn around um, eight weeks worth, worth of lesson plans and, and curriculum. Um, for a remote format versus this semester, faculty actually have time to plan for whatever modality the course will be offered with. So with languages, yes, the intention is still to make sure that students are building those proficiencies. Um, anecdotally, I've audited some language courses here at William & Mary for fun. Um, and a lot of them already have a, a homework component that's online where you're, you're taking quizzes and doing things like that online and listening and providing feedback. Um, so I think it's just kind of an expansion of, of those sorts of things. Um, Similarly, if it's okay with you, Heather, I'll talk a little bit about labs too, because I know um, in our office, at least we've gotten questions from folks about uh, how will labs work remotely for this fall? Um, and they're kind of looking at same sort of things that our foreign language folks are looking at. So uh, obviously lab environments can be really difficult to, to have safe distancing and that sort of thing. And so most of our uh, entry level labs will be offered remotely this fall. So what they're doing is they're looking at different video software and, and videos and, and things like that, that students can still learn, mess around as much as they can in this different environment. So again, the, the key here is our faculty have a chance to plan for these things as opposed to the spring semester. So I'm really confident that our faculty are uh, really taking their time and doing their research to make sure that regardless of the modality, the course will be offered and that students will still have a very positive educational experience. That was a wonderful answer, Shelly, thank you. And I'm interested to know your answer to this next question. Um, if you had to, no, wrong question. How is taking all of your classes remotely on campus better academically than taking all of your classes remotely from home? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I think a couple different things to think about. Um, 
I'm, go I'm going to assume that most folks that uh, opt to come to William and Mary and study at William and Mary uh, really value the community of scholars that we have here at William and Mary. And so while students might still have the opportunity to take all of their co courses remotely at home, and for some folks that's the right decision, that's what they need to do for their health and safety and the health and safety of their loved ones, um, for students that are able to be on campus, even if they are taking their courses remotely, there's so many opportunities within the community to get engaged with that, that community of scholars that I talked about. So whether that's, um, again, being able to meet up safely distanced with your faculty, um, having study groups with other students in the class, um, being able to take advantage of the resources that we have in, in SWIM library. I know our librarians are working really hard to make sure everyone has access to materials, but even just being able to, to congregate in a shared space at a safe distance wearing masks um, is, I think is really important to that process. So um, again, it, this is a very difficult decision for students and families to make, and I don't envy you all that are having to go through this, but those are some of the things that I think about, even for our students who might be living on campus taking remote courses, there are some other opportunities to engage with the community um, uh, around campus um, that just might not be available or not as easily available for students that aren't going to be with us here in Williamsburg. I don't know, Heather, what do you think? No, I think that that's definitely part of it. I know, especially for our new students, um, something that we talk about a lot at William & Mary is community and um, how strong a sense of community we have and how beneficial that is for students as they're navigating not only their academics, but also their experiences outside of the classroom. And I think we've heard from a lot of upperclassmen who are like, mom, dad, I love you a lot, but I need to be on campus. Um, whether it's just the physical space of being in an academic setting or, or being um, appropriate physically distanced from their, from their community, their people, the people who make them feel that they're at their best. Um, I, I think that's an aspect that's important to a student's education. Um, understanding that not all, not all families and students will be able to make that choice. And so I think that's something to consider is that if your student is able and, and you as a family feel that that choice is an option for you, will they benefit from being in a space where they're able to learn with others around others? All right, we have a lot of questions and I'm working through them. I promise I'm working down the list. We just, we have quite a few. So if you're like, Heather has not read my question yet, I, I'm getting there, I promise. Um, let's see here. What resources are available at William & Mary for students who are just not quite sure what they wanna major in? Ooh, this is like one of my favorite questions. Um, so uh, one of the reasons I got into this field is that I like to help students with that decision-making process. So. Um, all of that to say there are lots of different resources to kind of help students make decisions about um, majors and careers as well. Um, some students want to answer the career question first and the major and that sort of thing. So we try to um, support students no matter where they're coming at this. So our office works really closely with the Cohen Career Center um, to offer decision making resources. So whether those are tools that are on the Cohen Career Center's website so students can learn more about themselves with the understanding the more you know about yourself the easier it is to make a decision um, and in normal times we offer you know face-to-face -face workshops and things like that we're going to work on some different options obviously for this fall to support students in that process um, and then just kind of good old-fashioned face-to-face conversations whether that's with the advisors in our office with the folks in the career center with your faculty advisors um, with your instructors you know there's so many people around campus that um, Real, that we do what we do because we love working with students and we love talking to students and spending time with students. And so um, wherever your student finds that connection, um, you know, either they can be a resource or kind of point them in the right direction of other resources to help with that decision making process. One of the things I really like about William & Mary's curriculum is it's very intentional about holding off students from making a decision as soon as they enter. So um, for families out there, you know, maybe when you were a student or if you have other uh, students um, in your family that are in school, you know, a lot of schools ask right off the gate when they come in, what's your major? At William & Mary, we don't. We're really intentional about students taking time. We want them to take their call courses. We want them to do some exploration on campus through co-curriculars. Um, and we hold students off to make a decision, typically until their sophomore year. It's all based off of credits, but typically until their sophomore year, because we want to make sure students are comfortable and confident in the decision that, that they're making. Um, so again, there are resources and academic advising, 
in the Career Center. Um, students will find and learn things through their co-curricular activities, however they choose to get involved on campus. So lots of different opportunities to help students uh, answer those questions. Wonderful. I have a question here about will there be air conditioned space available for students to take classes, for example, the library, there will be, um, I'm posting in the chat now, the library's reopening plan. Our smaller study spaces won't be open initially within the library, but um, the library has been working diligently to reopen um, so that there is appropriate um, physical distancing within the library. Also, your students' residence hall lounges may be open and available for them to study and most of those, if not all of those are air conditioned. So I'm posting the library's reopening plan in the chat right now. Okay, so a, a student, it looks like, asks, um, if I have to stay home this semester, um, what will happen to my roommate and room if I want to try to come in the spring instead? And that's something that I would recommend that you reach out directly to Residence Life, email living at wm.edu, and they will be able to give you some clarification there. I don't believe we've had any information come out about what really happens if you decide to forego your housing contract in the fall um, and start up in the spring. So I would definitely recommend that you reach out to Residence Life at living at wm.edu, and be able to help you with that. Shelly, have you heard anything on that front? Um, so I, I did reach out just to ask um, because I've been getting questions from students, right, that are considering remote that went that um, for the fall and if safe to do so would like to come back in the spring. Um, the response that I heard back from Residence Life is that they would have to reapply uh, to live on campus in the spring and that they can't guarantee the same room. So um, like Heather said, still reach out to Residence Life to talk through all of this, but just understand that there's a reapplication process and there are, um, there are no guarantees. Thank you, Shelley. Is the open course list accurate when it lists a class as online or is that subject to change? It is accurate as of this moment. <laughs> um, so yes, we, uh, we are doing our best to make to keep that list accurate. As I mentioned, there might still be some shifts. Uh, we do have um, uh, one great example is from the, the business school. So for all of our students that are either business school majors, minors are taking just taking a class in the business school, they are actually working on offering all of their courses in each modality. Um, so students can have some flexibility. So uh, for students that are able to join face to face, that's great. And then for students who remote who need to be remote, there will be an option for them to enroll in a remote version as well. Um, we do have some other faculty within arts and sciences that are looking at doing something similar. So again, if they're offering a face to face or a mixed uh, version of their class, they might also build another section uh, for students that are remote. Um, no guarantees that that uh, that all faculty will go that route that way, of course, but some faculty are looking at that. So again, open course list is accurate at this moment. Uh, there may still be some changes coming down the pipeline, uh, but I would anticipate for the most part, it's gonna stay pretty stable. Thank you. Families wondering if students get to school and there's a spike in cases and for some reason we have to leave campus, um, what is the last day that a student could decide to take a semester off, or I would say withdraw from the semester? I'm going to pull that up because I don't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> um, but yes, there, there is a process by which um, students, once they are here, um, uh, if they needed to leave. So let me pull it up real quick. Um, so there are, Heather, is it, can I put the link in the chat? Would that be helpful? Let's see, Let's see if I can do that. Um, so this is the information on the withdrawal process. Um, again, it looks kind of, it looks a little different depending on the timeline um, in terms of how long uh, the student is before they end up making that decision. Um, and then obviously there's, there's kind of a, a separate, uh, I don't want to say separate process, but there are some different conditions for students that would need to make a medical withdrawal. So um, but that uh, website provides kind of the different variations there. So hard to say that there's like a hard and fast deadline. Um, it, it's just the process looks a little different depending on the, where we are in the semester. Understandable. Okay. Okay. 
You mentioned that there was a decrease in classroom capacity causing an increase in online modalities. Would holding classes outside ever be considered? Um, that's a fantastic question. I know anecdotally that that was brought up in some different places um, and we had a, a t um, leadership teams that specifically looked at de-densifying campus. Um, to my knowledge, that's not part of their plan for classrooms for this fall, but I do believe that was part of the conversation at some point. Um, so to my knowledge, no, we're not doing that, but it was part of the conversation. Uh, but like I said, I, I don't know enough about the details to know um, how they made that decision. Also, it's really hot here. I don't know how long I would last in an outside class. <laughs> Our weather is a little unpredictable here in Williamsburg. Right. Heather might have more stamina than I do, but I, it's... You know, I don't it's know just, about that. <laughs> too sticky. <laughs> okay. So I have another question about ad drop. Will students have the opportunity to change classes? Is there a specific window for that? Um, and are the new classes and modalities currently available for viewing online somewhere? Yes, so um, for students, if they go to the open course list, so courselist.wm.edu, um, first thing you want to do is select the right term because it always defaults for the term that we're in. So select fall 2020, and then you can search by uh, teaching attribute, you can search by um, discipline, all sorts of different things. So courselist.wm.edu is the best place to look for all of that. Um, I always encourage students to check their banner, their my.wm.edu for their specific registration windows. In general, for our continuing students, so our rising sophomores, juniors, seniors, they'll be able to get back into the registration system the first week of August and make changes to their schedule. So they'll have um, from the first week of August until August 13th to make changes to their schedule. And then our ad drop window runs from August 18th to August 27th. Okay. I'm seeing a couple questions here kind of along the same lines. I'm gonna try and add them in one question and hope that I answer them accordingly. When is the last day for a student to say, actually, you know, I think I'm gonna do this all online and all remote. Um, if if I cannot get some in-person classes by the end of the summer registration period? Yeah, um, so kind of lots of pieces to the puzzle. Um, so obviously different students have different registration windows. So one of the issues, right, is when you can make the changes to your classes that you wanna make um, for those determinations. Um, for our uh, continuing students, you know, I posted the link in the in the chat if they potentially wanted to withdraw from the institution for a semester um, and then come back, those types of things. So um, the Dean of Students Office manages that process. Uh, for students that have housing contracts, um, there's not necessarily a hard and fast deadline to cancel housing contracts by, um, but what they will do if a student requests to cancel a housing contract is they won't approve it until they can see a student is on, in all remote classes. Um, and then I know we talked earlier about Heather about meal plans and things like that too. So um, all that to say, <laughs> uh, there's not, again, not like a hard and fast deadline for, for folks to make this decision, just when they do make the decision, different things to take into consideration. So again, um, hopefully students can make changes to their schedule uh, as early as they can in August based off of their registration windows. Um, and then from there, kind of look at the, the ramifications on then uh, housing, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Will William and Mary do temperature checks along with testing? So additional information about testing plans and protocols will be coming out later this month. So please do um, keep watching your email and our newsletters. Um, details are still being finalized with um, some third party healthcare providers. Our testing and other public health protocols are based on um, ongoing modeling being developed by VCU, UVA, and Virginia Tech, um, and William and Mary is working with those institutions to develop that. So we do know that touchless temperature stations will be placed strategically around campus, and we will support self-assessment of students, but be, be on the lookout for more information about our testing protocols um, later this month. Shelly, when will the students be assigned a faculty advisor? 
Yes. So for our incoming freshmen, they will be assigned their advisor in August. Um, so for our incoming students back in May, which seems like ages ago, <laughs> uh, students were sent a survey called the um, New Student Inventory. And in that questionnaire, we asked students questions about their thoughts and preferences as far as majors go and things like that. So we, we try to match students up as much as possible based off of their interests with our faculty. So for our incoming freshmen, they will um, be matched up in early August. Uh, and during orientation, they'll have the opportunity to meet with that advisor. Again, it, it can all be remote, right, depending on the, on the student and where they are and things like that. But uh, during orientation, they'll have the opportunity to actually meet with their advisor. Wonderful. And we kind of went over this before the deadline for letting the university know if a student has decided not to come to campus. Um, see that question here? answered that question a few moments ago. This will be recorded, so if you want to go back and listen to that, um, it will be available here in the next couple days. With labs for courses such as biology that are remote asynchronous, does the lab fee still apply to the course? So um, I actually just got this question a couple days ago um, and uh, reached out to the biology and chemistry departments and that sort of thing. So they're actually in the process of assessing what lab fees may look like for the fall semester that hasn't been finalized yet. Um, obviously, it's not the same as when they actually have to purchase materials for a lab, but what they are looking at are different instructional materials uh, to provide in lieu of that in-person instruction, and there is a cost associated with those things. So our instructors are very conscious of costs and are looking for the most economical options to be able to do their labs remotely. Um, so I there isn't all that to say there's not a firm answer on that yet, but the instructors and our deans are looking at that now. If a student chooses to take a gap semester, will the assigned dorm be reassigned? We kind of covered this a little bit earlier, but um, basically the student is releasing themselves from their housing contract. And so we can't verify that that space or the roommate that was assigned to them will be available when they do choose to begin um, their studies on campus or live on campus again. So we can't confirm that that will be um, still available to them if they are releasing themselves from the contract. Other than college studies, can you advise on what are some good courses or requirements to focus on in the first semester of freshman year? It seems very open for students. Yes, and it is, and that's intentional. We want students to explore things that interest them. Um, so in general, when I'm talking to students in their first semester, um, they need to uh, register for either a call 100 or a call 150. Order doesn't matter, um, but we want them to take one of those in their first semester because then they'll take the other one in the following semester. Um, I want students to take a look at their proficiencies. Uh, if they still have a foreign language proficiency, um, maybe looking at the math proficiencies, those sorts of things. So proficiencies are another good place to look. Um, outside of that, encouraging students to look at the call 200s and our knowledge domains because those tend to be the types of courses for students that are considering different majors. Um, those courses uh, often fall into that like introductory course type of modality. So for example, um, your, your basic kind of psych courses, sociology, government, all those sorts of things. Uh, courses that would allow you to explore those as potential majors also count for either the call 200 requirements or the knowledge domain requirements. So really encouraging students to maybe do some exploratory work there. Um, another thing that I like students to think about is, are there things that you were just never exposed to prior to coming to William & Mary that you want to check out now? Um, you know, we tend to see lots of students that grow interests in, uh, you know, different aspects of the arts or philosophy and religion. Again, different subjects that they might not have had access to in their previous um, academic career, but now they do. So encouraging students to explore what interests them. You still have to have 72 credit hours outside of your major. So it's, it's taking some electives in your first semester is totally okay too. We want you to be excited to be here. We want you to be in courses that interest you. Um, related to that, the first semester tends to be the hardest academically. There's a lot of adjustment pieces um, for folks that are gonna come uh, be here in Williamsburg with us, right? That's gonna have its own adjustment piece to so living in a new place, living with a new person. Uh, even for folks that are gonna be joining us for the first time remotely, that's gonna have some adjustment pieces too. So I really like to encourage students to be really gentle with themselves, you know, pick things that interest you, you know, don't roll up into that upper level computer science course out the gate. 
Um, you know, take things that interest you, focus on the 100, 150 proficiencies, entry level stuff. Um, see how it goes in the first semester. And then if you're ready to knock it out of the ballpark with more credit hours, more upper level courses in the next semester, let's go for it. But the first semester is the hardest. So let's take it easy um, on ourselves and on each other and um, kind of explore some of those basics. Wonderful. I have a question about orientation here. Um, student plans to take classes remotely for the fall semester. Um, however, could easily drive to Williamsburg for an in-person orientation. The website mentions a virtual orientation for remote students. However, is it an option to attend just the orientation in person or part of it? I would highly, highly, highly recommend reaching out to the Office of First Year Experience to ask that question. Um, they'll be able to give you some more specifics on your ability to attend remote orientation. I would, I would guess that they're gonna encourage you to do the remote orientation option but I am not 100% sure of their answer. And so um, reaching out to the Office of First Year Experience um, and they'll be able to talk you through some of those options and what that will look like for you if um, you are driving down just to attend the in-person portions of orientation. I know they're working very hard though to make sure that the in-person portions of orientation are offered remotely for our remote students. Shelly, where can students see which classes are being offered online as opposed to in person? Good question. Um, so I utilize um, the course list website. And then if it's OK with you, Heather, I can pull that up. If you feel, OK. Um, share screen. Yes, I'm stealing the screen from you. OK. So this is the open course list site. So it's courselist.wm.edu. Um, like I mentioned, it always defaults to the term that we're currently in, um, which no one's looking for summer courses right now. Uh, we're looking for fall. So you want to select fall. And then when we get down here to the attributes, this is where you can see the different attributes for courses. So we have remote asynchronous, um, remote synchronous on campus, this is a tricky one. So RSOC still means that students will be here on campus. It's the faculty that will be remote, remoting in. But we're gonna use that as a verb now. They're remoting into the class. Um, so RSOC still has an on-campus component to it. Uh, remote synchronous off-campus means it's a remote course off-campus, so truly, truly remote but it is still synchronous. So there is still gonna be um, times, specific times where students need to meet up. The main thing to consider with those are for students that are not in the same time zone as us, right? So for our students in California, for our students in Europe, Asia, um, you know, I don't know what a 12 noon class looks like in those different time zones, zones for taking that into consideration. We also have mixed. Um, mixed assumes that there is still an option for students to um, come to campus in some capacity. And then the face-to-face -face synchronous. So for students that truly want to be remote, um, they want to search for courses with this RSOF or the RA. Um, and then from there, you can search for the other uh, variabilities too. But that's, um, that's the best place to look is courseless.wm.edu. For our continuing students who are already enrolled in classes, um, they can uh, look in Banner and they can actually find their courses in Banner um, and see them there. But for our incoming students in particular, that's the easiest way to look. Can students bring a bike with them on move-in day or should they bring it later? They can bring it on move-in day. It'll probably be easier just to get it all done in one fell swoop. Um, but of course they can always bring a bike later if they decide, you know, if they are walking to class, you know, if they're rolling out of bed at 8.25 and their class is at 8.30 and that walk is just too long, they can, they can get a bike when they discover they, they might need a bike to get around. It can be brought on move-in day. How many credits, Shelly, is considered full-time? Great, uh, great question. Um, so full-time is a minimum of 12 credit hours. On average, our students take about 15 credit hours per semester. Sometimes it might be a little higher, sometimes a little lower. Um, but 12 credit hours is the minimum to be full-time. Most of our courses are three credit hours, but obviously we have labs, um, some one credit, um, wellness courses, some one credit, uh, performing arts courses, things like that. So that's where some of that variability might come in. Um, but 12 is the minimum, 15 is kind of the average for what students typically do. 
I've also shared bike information and registration information in the chat if your student is interested in bringing a bike on campus. You can learn more in that link that I just shared. So if a student's class requires a professor exempted prerequisite alongside taking a co-requisite, who should the student contact to get an exemption? Can you say that one more time, Heather, just to make sure I understand yes. it? <laughs> yes, yes. If a student, uh, student's class requires a professor exempted prerequisite alongside taking a co-requisite, so it kind of sounds like they're taking the prereq and the co-requisite at the same time, mm -hmm. I could be interpreting that wrong. Who would they contact about getting the exemption? Um, so, always start with the instructor. <laughs> Let me backtrack. Um, instructors do have the ability to offer overrides into courses. Um, so the instructor is, is kind of the easiest place to start. Um, if it needs to go beyond that, then typically it's a coordination between the department chair and the registrar's office. But I would start with the instructor first and then go from there. Wonderful. Okay, I saw two questions that I'm going to lump into one question. So if a student builds a schedule and most of the classes they want are full or they're unhappy with all of the, place, all of the classes they've registered for, um, where do they go from there? So a couple of things to think about. Um, number one, students have multiple opportunities to make changes to their schedule. Um, so for incoming, for example, students, for example, they're slowly building it, right? So this summer they're registering for eight credits. Uh, they get here for orientation, they can go up to 16, and then they have the add drop window where they can continue to make changes to their schedule. For our continuing students, they have their first registration window in March. They've been able to make some changes um, throughout spring. Um, we kind of kick everyone out in the summer when we have our incoming students registering for classes and then our continuing students can get back in the first week of August to make changes. They have about a almost a two week window there um, and then they'll have the add drop window as well. So all of that to say there are lots of opportunities for students to make changes to their schedule if need be. Um, you know sometimes students get stuck in classes that they are not excited about or um, uh, you know, there's something about it that that is kind of a source of frustration. So then it's kind of a matter of looking to see, well, do you still need to take this course? Um, could you take it in another semester? Could you swap it out for a different course? Or is it just you need to take this course and this is really the only way to take it, right? Like it's just going to be an 8 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm just making that up. But I know that's a, a point of contention for some folks. Um, and, and we just need to do it and it'll um, not be fun, but we're going to do it and we're going to knock it out of the ballpark, right? And then we're going to move forward for the next semester. So I think it depends on um, what exactly is the source of frustration for the student? Are there opportunities to make changes and transitions? Um, and if not, kind of evaluating how do we make the best of this uh, situation, given that there are requirements to earn a degree from William and Mary, right? And so sometimes we have to take classes. You know, I didn't want to take any um, math in college, but I did. Um, Right, and so sometimes we just have to find a way to commit to something and, and work through it. And same thing with 8 a.m. So again, it depends on what the source of the frustration is, but we can typically support a student to figuring that out. How do students get AP and early college experiences approved? So for um, any AP, IB, dual enrollment um, sort of credits, uh, that information should be sent to the registrar's office. Um, a lot of times, depending on when they took the courses, um, they might have already been sent in when the student applied to William & Mary and then the registrar's office already has it. If not, you want to make sure you submit that information to the, to the registrar's office for them to review and evaluate. If you go onto the course catalogs website, um, and I can put this in the chat, it's catalog.wm.edu. Um, you can actually go there and see how uh, AP and IB uh, courses translate into either course exemptions or course credit. So that's all on the course catalog website. Um, and again, with dual enrollments, just make sure those final transcripts are sent to, to William & Mary. The key is we need the final transcripts to be able to award credit. Okay, so I have two questions that are kind of in the same vein. Someone says, I thought it was mandatory for freshman students to be on campus during their first year. 
Second, as so based on that answer to a question that was probably many moons ago because we've asked a lot of questions, which I'm so thankful for. Um, do freshman students have the choice to take all classes remotely rather than on campus for this fall semester? Oh, is that for me? <laughs> do I get to do that one? Um, so my understanding is that freshmen, so the, our policy still stays in place, right? We're not changing our policy. Um, freshmen, sophomores, students are still required to live on campus unless their permanent home address is within 60 miles and they want to commute or their fall coursework is fully remote and they wish to stay at their permanent home address. Um, so that's kind of the line that we're drawing. So it's not so much that we're changing the policy and I'll copy and paste. Um, whoop, that's not what I was trying to copy. Um, I'll copy and paste that into the chat so folks can look at it as well as a reference link to it. Um, but that's kind of what we're putting forward is again, we obviously in normal times, our preference is for everyone to be here in Williamsburg with us. Uh, we recognize we are not in, in normal times right now. And so we're trying to offer flexibility for folks. Um, so yes, you can opt to do your, your fall semester coursework fully remotely and stay at your permanent home address. Okay, can you explain the difference between RSOC and RSOF? Yes, that one's very confusing. <laughs> um, so our, uh, where's my, hold on, I have a really good little cheat that I use and I think it's helpful, but I've got too many screens up and I can't find everything. Um, so here, I'm going to steal your screen again, Heather, um, and I'm going to put it on this screen. So this is a site that the uh, registrar's office created and made available for folks to check out. Um, so RA, predominantly remote and predominantly asynchronous, makes sense for most folks, right? It's going to be a remote class and it's asynchronous, meaning you're not expected to meet up at specific times. Um, vast majority of instruction will be asynchronous. RSOC means it's still going to be it, it's still going to be remote. It's going to be synchronous, but it's going to be on campus. So in RSOC, the instructor is remote. The students are on campus. Um, some faculty have opted to go for that modality because it still allows for some of the conversations and things like that that they want to build face to face, even if for the instructor, um, uh, they might not be able to join students in person. So that's, that's, uh, might be a reason why an instructor picked that option versus RSOF, meaning still remote, still synchronous, but off campus. So everyone's off campus. So, um, so yes, yeah, so for students that uh, intend to be remote, they need to register for RA or, or RSOF courses. Again, if you tend to be remote, RA or RSOF. And I'll, um, Heather, I'll put the link to this in the chat too. Okay, I see a question here. It's, it's been a really popular question this week. Um, understandably, sleep is really important. Question about, on the list of items for students not to bring on move-in day is a mattress pad to cover the bed. Can you clarify what they can bring to cover the mattress? I have a wonderful update, which I'm gonna post in the chat. Um, so an update from William & Mary Residence Life, mattress pads and toppers will be permitted in the residence halls. However, they must be removed when students check out of their rooms at the end of the year. Um, so if you do wanna see that packing list, I'm gonna copy and paste the, the move-in website. Um, so that you can see the full packing list. There's a student packing list and a family packing list of helpful things to bring on move-in day, but mattress pads will be allowed. Does William & Mary have the adequate bandwidth, high-speed internet for a surge in online classes on campus? I will say that our, our IT folks have really stepped up in the last few months. Um, they had to make the transition quickly in the spring semester, and we've learned lots of things from that spring semester, and they have been working diligently over the summer um, to ensure that all of our systems are up to date, all of our speeds are adequate, and that even all of our classroom spaces um, have the adequate technology to be able to support remote classes or classes that are being live streamed, things of that nature. 
you can actually follow along with IT on Facebook. I do to see what they're up to. Um, and they have been going through each of the classrooms to ensure that they are set up and equipped to be able to offer remote classes um, for the fall semester. So William & Mary is taking steps necessary to ensure that our Wi-Fi systems and all of our other online systems are able to handle um, the capacity that will be needed this fall semester. Are there any other online courses like college studies that students are required to take before the semester begins? I'm going to pull up the tribe guide checklist because I believe that there is. Okay, so yes, yes, there is. Um, so beginning on July 31st, there will be a course offered called Alcohol EDU um, and also Sexual Assault Prevention. These two courses are online courses that students will need to take, especially for the class of 2024. It's on their checklist. I believe it's on the transfer checklist as well. Um, and so a hold may be placed on a student's account if they are not completed by the appropriate deadline. But all of that information is on the Tribe Guide checklist. And I'm going to paste that in the chat as well. Okay, Shelly, I had a question about Call 200 courses. Is that something that our incoming um, freshmen can take or do they need to wait until their second year at William & Mary? Yes, yeah, so students, um, incoming students can take Call 200 courses. Um, it's a little challenging, right, because sometimes the numbers for our Call 200 courses are 200s or maybe 300s, um, but, but the intention isn't to, um, to uh, discourage our incoming students, our freshmen, from taking those courses. So yes, incoming students can totally take Call 200 courses. When in the orientation process do they sign up for their remaining courses? So on Monday, August 17th at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs> they can enroll in up to 16 credit hours. I love that specific time. <laughs> it's all like, there's not much up there right now because uh, pandemic, but some things are sticking. <laughs> okay. I'm going to pull up some information here. Okay, so I have a question about what will be the course or plan of action in case of a, a COVID test positive on campus. Um, so there has been a residence hall identified for housing any on-campus students with a positive COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, active cases will be monitored through the Student Health Center. Um, we're still working on some of these policies and protocols and more information definitely will come. Um, so symptomatic individuals awaiting test results will need to self-quarantine and they, rather than remain in their assigned residence halls, those students may choose temporary housing in Richmond Hall, which has been set aside for um, quarantine or isolation um, and students may also opt to return to their permanent home or family address as they await results so that's a family decision that can be made but there is a space available for students we'll make sure that students have all the medical equipment that they need that they're fed and watered um, and that they're able to isolate safely and also that we'll work with their professors to ensure that they can continue their courses as they're able to do so more information about our testing protocols um, and policies related to testing and isolation will be coming out later this month. So do keep an eye on your email for those sorts of information. Is there a place, Shelly, that a student um, can see how many credits they've earned through AP, IB, or DE? Sure. Um, so two places a student can check. They can go onto their banner, so my.wm.edu, and log into their banner, and they can see their transcript there, um, and that will show you show them everything that they brought in with them. They can also check Degree Works, which is linked in banner, or they uh, can go to the Degree Works site, um, and that will also show them any uh, credits that they brought in with them. Wonderful. We're getting to the end of questions. So if you have some, please feel free to submit those. If you've joined us a little bit late, we're submitting questions through the chat. Shelly Lorenzo is here from Academic Advising to answer any of your um, academic 
um, course registration advising related questions. I'm handling all of the other questions as the assistant director of parent and family programs. The session has been recorded. So if you um, joined us here in the last 10 minutes or so, and you're like, oh, so many great questions that I missed, it will be available for you to view on our YouTube channel. This is an interesting question, Shelly. Since it looks like many classes may be remote, how are roommates going to navigate taking classes from their rooms at the same time? That is a good question. That, um, I honestly haven't thought about it before. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think this is like yeah. an interesting layer to the roommate agreement that might happen at the beginning of the semester. I, those, I you know, those conversations that are like, are you a morning person or an evening yeah. person? Like, do you, do you shower at night or do you shower in the morning? Like this might be one of those questions of like, so do we have courses at the same time? If we do, how do we want to navigate that? Like, does right. one of us want to use headphones? Do we have noise canceling headphones? You know, would it be better if I go to the lounge? Would it be, you know, that might yeah. just be one of those conversations that um, in a typical semester we might not have with our roommates, but might need to be woven into the conversation. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's one of those things, like you said, Heather, students are, are going to figure this out. I have also heard that there are plans for some more, um, kind of not formalized, but some outdoor seating options in terms of like more Adirondack chairs and things like that. So weather dependent, um, there might be opportunities for, for students to go outside and study. And um, I have to imagine, you know, for some of our families joining us, you might have already been doing some of these negotiations, right? Negotiations, right? Like if your students been home finishing up their high school year and you're working from home, um, I feel like, you know, we're all getting a lot better at having these negotiations about space and, 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 and that sort of thing. I mean, I'm in our, the one office we have in our house and I'm like really mad that my husband didn't put away all the laundry, but here we are and we're negotiating, right? <laughs> we're figuring it out. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely a new take on that roommate conversation that's going to happen there at the beginning of the semester. So if a student takes a lighter load in the fall due to a condensed semester, can they make it up in the summer? And if so, is that included in the 2021 tuition? And is there a limit to the number of credits they can take? So an overall general summer question. Yes, and you know, I'll, I'll be honest, this, uh, the way that we are um, looking at our summer for summer 2021 is, is completely different than how we've ever looked at summers before. So I think there's lots of things that we haven't fully fleshed out yet. Um, you know, the intention behind creating a summer semester as opposed to a summer session is we wanted to make sure that there are plenty of options for students, especially if they do either need to take time off or a reduced load. Um, we wanted to make sure that there were, uh, there was a summer semester to help um, uh, students fill any potential gaps again if they needed to take time off. Um, the logistics of that still haven't been fully fleshed out yet, and I would defer to the bursar's office on any questions about tuition and billing. Um, I just, I don't want to speak outside of my lane. Um, so I would check in with that. Um, I will also say too, in, in normal times right now, our faculty are giving us courses for the spring, right? Like later on, we'd be getting courses for the summer. Um, so as you can imagine, um, so much of our time and energy has been focused on uh, the fall semester and making sure folks are, are safe and well, um, that we're, uh, that some of those processes are just going to be a little delayed for us right now in terms of figuring out exactly what will be offered and when. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we are, we are working on things to make it, uh, to make it a useful experience again for students that either need to take fewer credits or an underload or might need to, uh, uh defer for, for whatever reason. So if you get credit from an AP course, but want to take it again at William & Mary, for example, biology, do you still get credit for the three credits from the AP test or does that go away? Great question. Um, so students do have the opportunity to revoke any credits earned pre-matriculation. So bio is a great example. Um, you know, we do see a lot of our students revoke their AP bio credit because they want to take it here. Um, especially for students that are interested in pre-med, uh, that, that seems to be a good option for them and, and something that they're considering. Um, so yes, if, if you opt to take the course here, you need to revoke the credit earned. Um, if you're on the fence about it, I would encourage you to, again, you can meet with an advisor in our office, you'll meet with your pre-major advisor at, at orientation. If this is specifically related to a pre-professional program, um, 
most of those programs have information on their website that you can kind of double check or reach out to that point person. Um, so I'll pull up that link for our pre-professional advisors um, because I don't want to make any assumptions, but I tend to get that question a lot around pre-med students. So I'm going to put that information in the chat if that's helpful. I have another AP question. Is there a deadline to have AP classes applied to a student's transcript for college credit? So there's not a deadline per se, but we would like you to do it as soon as possible, um, just so that it's there and it's reflected on their transcript. The reason I say that is, um, you know, I've encountered seniors that are, are delayed in their graduation application because those three credits from dual enrollment uh, never transferred in, right? Or those AP scores never got here. So there's there's not a deadline um, to get those things to us, but I do encourage students to, uh, and families to get that information to us as soon as possible. So it's here and not to stress about it later. If it's done, you don't have to worry about it. That's great advice. Will there be any in-person activities for families during move-in days? There will be. I'm very excited about it. Um, so as your students moving in, we're gonna have five welcome tents located throughout campus. Um, just to say hello and answer any questions that you have, they're sponsored by parent and family programs. And um, we'll be giving away water, fingers crossed, in a very safe and environmentally health and safety approved manner that follows CDC guidelines. It'll probably be a little bit like going to your favorite fast food restaurant where I pass you a tray and then you grab a bottle of water. Um, but we still wanna welcome everybody to campus. So that's one of our in-person components. There will be a completely remote orientation that kicks off on August 16th for parents and families of incoming students. And more information about that will be coming most likely next week. Um, so August 16th will be the, the the core of our online orientation content and then um, on the, that following Monday and Tuesday we'll have some optional breakout sessions for families to attend as well. If a student takes a language placement exam will the results be automatically registered so that he can enroll in the appropriate language course? Yes, um, and so we do in college studies have a deadline for students to complete the foreign language placement exam by so that way we can get everything loaded by the time they register. If a student isn't able to take it until after that deadline, um, and I apologize that deadline's not in my head anymore because I've passed it. <laughs> um, but if a student is, is past that deadline or doesn't see anything, I encourage them to talk to contact the language placement director and that information is in college studies so they can contact them. So students can still take the foreign language placement exam today. Um, we just want to make sure uh, that students then contact that language director so they know um, and then they can review the scores and then the registrar's office can then upload them into the student's banner account. Um, another piece of that puzzle is for some of our foreign languages they're automatically scored in Blackboard. For other languages there's actually a piece that needs to be manually reviewed um, so all that to say, sometimes it can take a little bit of time. All right. You said July 17th at 5.30 is open registration. Is each student given an exact time after that or is it a free for all? August 17th. Um, <laughs> August 17th at 5.30. So that is our um, kind of last shot for all of our incoming students to finalize their schedule. So our incoming transfers and our incoming freshmen. Um, so our incoming transfers registered back in June, our incoming freshmen are registering this month. Um, and then for our incoming students to get to their full schedule, there's this last window on August 17th at 5.30 for our incoming students to finalize their schedule. So again, that's just for our incoming students. Um, I also encourage uh, folks, uh, for students in particular, to check their banner, check my.wm.edu to confirm all of your registration windows. Um, just want to make sure that those dates and times are on your calendar. They tend to, we try to make them very long windows. Again, some folks um, in, in normal times, right, sometimes we have folks that are out, uh, not able to have internet access for a week at a time, and so that's why we try to give longer windows for some of these things. Um, so check your banner for the specific time windows. Um, but yes, uh, for all of our incoming students, they can finalize their fall schedules or begin to finalize it on August 17th. And then our add drop window runs from that Tuesday, which is August 18th, all the way until August 27th. And the add drop window is for all students, continuing new students. Any student can make changes from August 18th to August 27th. 
Wonderful. I have another question about music, which we covered a long time ago, um, and now I can't remember the answer. <laughs> Um, our son is interested in taking applied music lessons in piano and organ. Is this possible during the pandemic? And do we know of any precautions in place if these are um, happening in person? So my understanding for now is that those, uh, those lessons will still be taking place face-to-face. Um, -face. Um, as far as what the specific guidelines look like for those classes, I don't know. Um, you know, my hunch is how we've been incorporating guidelines and other aspects of teaching will be incorporated there in terms of proper distancing, uh, disinfecting, um, those sorts of things. Uh, but yes, for right now, the, it sounds like our music lessons will be happening face to face. Okay, and I, I see a question that just came through, which is our last question. So if you've been sticking around and you're like, Heather, you didn't answer my question, there's a really strong possibility that I may have accidentally scrolled past it. So please feel free to submit it again. And again, we're here for about 30 more minutes, so we do have time for more questions. Um, so if a senior physics student chooses spring and summer semesters, how do they determine without conflict availability of remaining classes? Good question. So once students are in their major, right, or in their senior year, I really encourage them to work with their major advisor and. Um, to figure out some logistics. The reason I say that is a lot of times decisions about when courses are offered or um, kind of in this, in this realm we're currently in, how they're offered are made at the departmental level. Um, and so for students that are seniors trying to figure out how they wanna plan things out going forward, I would encourage them to talk to their major advisor. Um, Cause again, that uh, faculty member will be in those departmental meetings and will know what will happen, what's happening when. Um, the other thing that's important too is um, again, in normal times, sometimes certain courses are only offered in certain semesters. Um, but as we're looking at building in the, the summer semester option for students, students need to know what's going to be offered then. Right now, nothing's been published yet, but at a departmental level, uh, the department chair, um, his major advisor in the department, uh, those folks should have more information. So um, when it gets that granular, I really encourage students to work directly with their major advisor uh, and or department chair um, just to make sure that they know what's happening at that level um, and what's being planned for at that level to ensure that they can graduate. Okay. Will faculty be on campus for in-person office hours? Um, it, it's up to the discretion of the faculty member. Um, so some faculty, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the majority of our faculty wanted to do face-to-face -face instruction, um, but were limited because of our classroom capacities that had to be adjusted for distancing. So a lot of our faculty um, are actually on campus right now, like they've, they've still been going in um, and, and that sort of thing. Um, our labs, a lot of our labs opened back in June. Um, so we do have a number of faculty that are on campus. So I would anticipate that there will be faculty that will have face-to-face -face, uh, op open hours, office hours, that sort of thing for students. Um, but then we also have faculty who um, have their own kind of health wellness concerns or concerns for the loved ones in their house. So they might be making different decisions based off of that. Um, we're very fortunate at William & Mary that we care about community and we're also small enough and nimble enough that we can kind of allow a lot of flexibility for students. So even for faculty that might have in office, uh, office hours, you know, they would still be meeting with students via phone or Zoom, that sort of thing. Um, and again, with faculty that aren't able to come to campus uh, for whatever reason would still be working with students remotely. So a question to piggyback off of the piano question, what arrangements will be in place so that students can practice their instruments safely in practice rooms? Shelly, have you heard anything about practice spaces in the music department? I haven't heard anything specifically from music yet. Um, I can do a little bit of digging on the website to see what I can find, but I haven't heard anything specific yet. I haven't heard anything specific either, um, but Shelly, if you know of like a, con a general contact for the music department, that would probably be a good one to paste in the chat um, to contact directly as they'll, um, it, it might vary depending on space and, and they might be working out their reopening plan right now as well. So Shelly, we'll spend a moment maybe identifying a contact and we'll hopefully get that for you. When will semester courses be published? Are, I believe fall semester courses already are. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Spring, so, 
what's the timeline for the spring, sure. summer? Yeah. Sure. So, um, so yes, all of our fall courses are already published. Again, there might be some um, slight adjustments as we move forward. Um, we do have some tentative spring courses out there, but again, those um, are also subject to change. Um, this is typically the time of year when we start solidifying our spring schedule, but of course, um, we're, we're so focused on, on fall right now, um, we haven't got, quite gotten to that point yet. But yes, all of our fall courses are published. Again, might be some changes. Spring information is uh, published, um, but that would definitely be there. I would anticipate some modifications there right now. Okay, will there still be opportunities for freshman research? I am going to take a general answer while Shelly is looking around, but I'm going to say yes. It might not be the way research traditionally occurs as things are happening a little bit unconventionally this semester, but research is one of the hallmark experiences of a William & Mary degree, and I believe that faculty are still willing to work with students during this time to provide them opportunities for research. Yes, um, so I know even this summer, um, like I mentioned, some of our, our science labs have already opened. They opened back uh, either end of June or early July. Um, so we do have some labs that are open, right? And obviously the lab coordinators had to come up with very specific plans for what that looks like and, and how students move through there. Um, but we also have lots of students that do uh, online research. Um, and that sort of thing. So yes, research is still happening. We still want to support students doing research. Obviously, it might look a little different in these conditions, but yes, research is still happening. Wonderful. Any recommendations for items to make remote learning easier for students? For example, desk organizers, bring your own printer, etc. I would say, again, this is going to be subject to every student, how every student learns and what works best for them. I think glass half full. A lot of students have the experience of experiencing remote learning in some shape or form during the spring semester. So what were the things that really worked well for them? What were the things that didn't work well for them? What were the things that they just really relied on every day? Was it, did they need to purchase a, a headset like I have purchased? Did they, did they need um, an updated webcam? Was there, did they, find that they didn't take paper and pencil notes anymore, that they were taking notes online. What were the strategies that really worked for them? Um, and Shelly has also posted a link in the chat um, for studying with distance learning. That's a really great resource for students to examine, but I think it's gonna be important for them to be reflective about what worked well for them in the spring and what didn't work well for them in the spring and, and, how, can, um, and how they can maybe make this experience a little bit better for themselves now that they have time to plan accordingly. So a question about printers, do students need a printer in their room? Optional, I don't think it's a need. There will be um, the ability for students to print on campus as they typically do, I believe. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read in on the library's reopening, but Shelly. Yeah, I, um... I mean, I, I, I will say anecdotally, I feel like we've gone to a lot more um, online resources. So I, I would hope a student would need to print maybe as much as they normally do, but I, I could totally be wrong, right? Like, I don't wanna speak out of turn. So it looks like um, printers will be available for use in SWIM. Um, so that, that is an option for folks if, if they need to access that. And I think, again, Shelly kind of I don't know that students need to rely on printing as much as they once did. Again, if a student learns best and they want to print out all of their materials, again, that's something to consider. Um, if they're a heavy printer right now, they might remain a heavy printer when they are um, on campus in the fall. And I think that's just a decision. Do they want to walk over to the library to print off their materials or would they rather just do it in their residential space? If the student is graduating high school with associate's degree credits and only plans to attend William & Mary for two or two and a half years, will they still be required to live on campus their second year? I, I'm going to let you go, <laughs> Shelly. Yeah, um, uh, so uh, I believe so. Um, and so here's why I, here's why I say that. Um, so for the vast majority of our students that come in with associate's degrees, they're transfer students. 
Um, and so they applied as transfer students, um, and that was kind of their intention from the beginning. Um, for students that um, for students that applied as freshmen and might have earned an associate's degree along with their high school diploma, I believe they are still treated as incoming freshmen and therefore still have to live on. Yes, I, I'm going to confirm that it's based on social class, which is the, if they're coming in in their first year at William & Mary as just graduating from high school, first time in college, um, even if they are coming in with that amount of credits, it goes by social class. So, for example, social class 2024 is still expected to live on first and second year unless they are falling within these um, COVID-specific exemptions. I hope that answers that question. I'm going to find, though, the contact. I believe it to be residence life. So I'm going to put that email address here. Since that is such a nuanced question, I think reaching out to Campus Living at living at wm.edu um, would be a great idea to just get a confirmation there. Shelly, do you know if students are allowed to record lectures? That's a really good question. Um, I, so I guess a couple things, right? Like are we talking about in person, if they're face-to-face -face versus remote? Um, I, I, I know we have students that do that. Um, I mean, I, I think you would want to get approval from the faculty in advance um, to do that. Uh, but again, I know in, in normal times we have students that do that either as a refresher or roll back to um, and things like that. So I, I believe it's really just a matter of clearing that with the instructor in advance. For online classes, will midterms and final exams be in person or online? Great question. Um, so let me pull up my calendar because I haven't memorized that far out into the future, <laughs> into the future yet. Um, so uh, the short answer is whatever the modality the course is taught in, um, I understand that to be the modality that you would take your exams in. Um, and so we have, let me get that real quick. You know, our, November 13th is the last day of classes and then finals run from November 16th until November uh, 24th. So I would assume that the modality that the class is taught in is the modality that the exams would be given in. Um, once students receive their syllabus, it'll be very clear and explicit there. Uh, but that's going to be my hunch because, again, this is one of those things instructors have some, some flexibility. But if, if a student's in all remote, we're not going to make a student come to campus to take the final, right? Like, we're not doing that. Um, so my hunch is whatever the modality is. Thank you, Shelly. Okay, I see no more questions in my queue. So, again, if you submitted a question and you say, Heather, you did not ask my question, now is a great time to retype in that question. We got quite a few, and so I may have scrolled by it, and I do apologize for that. Um, but if you do have any lingering questions, we have about 10 more minutes with Shelly to answer some of these questions. Are there any courses only offered for one semester that are required courses that like would never be offered again? Um, or are required courses offered both semesters every semester? Um, uh, great question. It, um, some courses are sequential and so we would only offer them in the fall because then you would take the next part in the spring. Um, so that's one thing to, to take into consideration. Um, for example, our chemistry sequence, sequencing starts, um, general chemistry in the fall, organic in the spring, that sort of thing. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, languages are another good example. Typically, we just have our 101s in the fall, our 102s in the spring, our 201s in the fall, and our 202s in the spring. If you hop onto the course catalog, catalog.wm.edu, and you look at the course descriptions, when you click on a course description, it'll tell you typically which semesters they're offered in, either fall, spring, or, or both. Um, so that's kind of a good way to check um, to see when they're offered. So uh, all that to say, it kind of depends on the class um, or the, the discipline in terms of how often they would offer a course. 
Okay, is FS really a face-to-face in-person class? Yes, that is the intention is that students would be meeting on campus in a classroom. Um, again, the classroom setups are probably going to look different than normal um, uh, for classrooms that have um, movable seating, right? The, the seating would be moved around to allow, to allow for proper distancing. Uh, for classrooms with fixed seating, it would just be kind of clear who sits where um, to ensure proper distancing. But yes, that is the intention that for face-to-face synchronous courses is that they are actually meeting um, on campus uh, in a classroom for, for class. Um, and if you check in the open course list uh, or in banner, you should be able to see the room location and that sort of thing too. My daughter emailed her peer advisor, but has not heard back yet. How long should we expect to wait? Sure. So we, we ask our peer advisors to respond within 24 hours. If it's been longer than that, um, please email advising at wm.edu. For asynchronous courses, how does a student know when their exams are going to be? Mm -hmm. So for asynchronous courses, chances are you will either have a window in which to complete something or a specific uh, time that something is due. Um, so again, when you get the syllabus, it, it should spell it all out there. So asynchronous doesn't necessarily mean everything's just due by the last day of classes and you call it a day. Um, typically, you'll have kind of points where assignments are due or windows to take assignments such as e exams and things like that. Um, what it doesn't mean is that you have like a Tuesday, Thursday set time you have to meet with everyone. So again, the in intention is to allow for flexibility. So again, you might have a due date or you might have a window to complete something. Um, and especially for the asynchronous courses, those can be extremely beneficial for students that aren't in our, in our time zone, right? So for our students that, um, you know, an 8 a.m. class would look very different for them um, than it would for us. Um, so that's the intention there. But again, with the remote asynchronous, you know, you would have assignments due at certain times or windows with, uh, with which to complete assignments. Okay, this is a great question that I'm seeing here that I don't know the answer to. So I am going to put the contact information here and Shelly might know, but if not, I'm going to put the proper contact information. If a student has a new medication, do they need to update the health portal now or can they wait until they get here? I don't know the answer to that question. Yep, me neither. <laughs> it's a really great question though. No, yeah, nor would I want to pretend to know the answer. <laughs> yeah, me, me neither. So I'm gonna put the phone number for the health center. It would be best to contact them directly to ask that question. Now, I am also going to contact them directly and ask that question in the next week. And if I get an answer, I will share it via email um, with all families so that they know the best protocols there. Okay. If you withdraw from the university for the fall semester, when do you reinstate to register for spring classes? Oh, that's a good question. Let me... Let me look that up <laughs> so I can give you the right date. <laughs> so for students that would want to re-enroll after withdrawal, um, the deadline for the spring semester is November 15th. And I'll put the link with re-enrollment information in the chat. OK. Are physical textbooks still recommended or required for classes? My understanding is that students have flexibility there, right? We want to make sure that you have access to the materials you need to be successful in the classroom. Um, I don't know if it um, necessarily matters um, if they are uh, electronic versus um, paper versions. If there is something specific that the instructor requires, they'll put that in the syllabus uh, that you can check out to, to confirm. Um, but really, for the most part, faculty just want to make sure you have access to the materials. Um, and almost like Heather was alluding, alluding to earlier when we were talking about what you need to be successful as a remote student, some of that's personal preference too in terms of, you know, would you rather have an electronic version because it's easier to just keep in one spot um, versus would you rather uh, um, do, right, do you need to hold like, you know, my best friend's like this. She has to hold the book, otherwise it's not real. So, you know, whatever's going to work for you to be successful. 
Okay. I also posted a link there for ordering textbooks. Um, it talks about where to order them from, how to identify what textbook you're looking for, and steps to reserve those books from the bookstore. And if you have questions, you can always contact the bookstore directly about textbooks. Um, da, 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 da. Are students allowed to defer their start date if they don't start this fall? I so I, I'm assuming that means defer as in start either in the spring semester or the following um, the following fall semester. The Office of Admissions handles that process of deferrals, and I will um, I will put that link in the chat. In normal times, the deadline to request a deferral is back in June. Um, we are obviously not, um, oh, good, you put it in the chat. Um, we are obviously not in normal times. Um, so I would encourage you to reach out to the Office of Admissions if a deferral is, is uh, what you and your family are strongly considering. Okay. I see a couple um, questions about clubs and organizations and how all of that will happen this fall. Um, I'm gonna reiterate, community is huge for students at William & Mary, and so organizations will still be meeting. It just might look a little different than it has in years past. So whether that's virtual gatherings, they gather in spaces that are um, large enough to accommodate group size. Um, and also this is a condensed semester, so like all the things that organizations typically do in the fall semester might not happen just due to time, but organizations are still going to be meeting and they're still going to be recruiting and they're still going to be looking for students to join their circle. Um, so that's definitely something that's going to happen. And as we approach the fall semester, your student and you will learn more about what exactly those um, changes will look like, but I can confirm that organizations um, and clubs are not canceled due to COVID-19. Um, our students, our students still need to to connect with like-minded individuals, and so that will continue to happen. Okay, so I just texted someone who might know the answer to um, our. Um, medication question. Um, so you don't have to, if it's just an update in medication, um, you don't have to worry about um, changing it right now as long as it's not part of the immunizations list. You can worry about that when you get here. So it's not something, if, it, if it's just a new medication, don't worry about it now. Um, you can make that change when you get here, unless it's one of the immunizations, in which case that's something the health center would need to have on record. Okay, I got a question. Is there going to be an organization fair? There typically is during orientation, and I know that they are working very, very diligently to provide a blended option for an organization fair in order to maintain um, physical distancing guidelines and best practices. So there will be opportunities for students to learn all about the organizations that are at William & Mary during orientation. I've got a lengthy question here, so I'm going to read. Please forgive me. Okay, I have two sons attending William & Mary. We are leaning towards staying at home in Japan for the fall semester considering the many factors involved. My incoming freshman student will be registering for courses knowing our situation and the course delivery modes for the fall. However, my rising junior registered for courses in the spring not considering the possibility for remote learning. We have a major time difference so not all courses work for us. Will professors be able to work with students to sign up for courses or remote learning that might be full by the time the August 4th through 13th window opens? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, so so uh, a couple of things. Obviously, our, our incoming students now are just starting to build their schedule. And for our continuing students, they registered in March, right, before we really knew uh, what all of this would look like. Um, uh, and then they'll be able to go back in that first week of August to make changes to their schedule as, as need be. Um, for students that want to be remote, they need to register for either um, RA, um, Remote Asynchronous, or RSOF, Remote Synchronous Off-Campus Courses. Um, but obviously uh, for students um, in, in vastly different time zones than the Eastern, uh, Eastern time zone, then that's a big factor to consider in terms of what that looks like or what that might mean. Um, I think a couple of things. If if possible, if there's po if it's possible to swap any of those courses into a remote asynchronous course, obviously that would be um, that would be the easiest option. Um, 
if the student is in RSOF courses, um, I would encourage them to reach out to the instructor to see if there would be any options or opportunities uh, for workarounds there. Um, again, it, it kind of depends on the class, right? So if it's um, if there are other sections that would automatically fit, I would encourage you to swap into sections that you know are going to fit with your needs. Um, and if not, if you know if it's a course you need for your major, it's a course they only offered in the fall semester, that sort of thing. Then touching base with the instructor to see if it would be okay. You're still taking it remotely, right? So they're still not going to expect to see your face on campus. Um, but would it be possible to review lectures later and that sort of thing? So. Um, I think seeing what you can do that first week of August would be my first step and then contacting instructors to see what flexibility they have with the remote synchronous courses. Wonderful. Okay, so we are out of time. I know that we um, we have a couple more questions there, but we are we are running out of time and um, I just want to make sure that you all know that you can submit your questions to families at wm.edu. So any questions that we were unable to answer or you need clarification on, please send to families at wm.edu. Now we won't be able to get back to you immediately um, because we will be back in the office on Monday morning and it may take us a little bit to get the correct answer to your question, but um, please do send us those questions. You can send us to send us those questions anytime. We will be back again next Friday for another Family Friday session and I'll have more information um, in the next couple days about who will be joining us and what the topic will be. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you Shelly for joining us. I know um, you got a lot of questions. We we got, we got through a lot of questions. I'm so glad this worked out. Like I'm I'm glad that this was useful for folks to do this, right? Like I think that's the key. Is um, two hours went by, um, and the only reason I know it's five o'clock is because my dog's telling me it's time for dinner. So like <laughs> I don't know if folks can see like this little white tip like wandering around the door. Like okay, get up, mom, time to feed me. <laughs> yes, and so if if you. If you joined us late and you want to know about all the questions that we asked before, this was recorded. I will be uploading this to our YouTube channel. Um, and so you can find that on our website at www.wm.edu slash families under our resources and tools tab. Um, but with that, I'm going to close this out. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening and a great weekend. And we will see you next Friday. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Have a good weekend.